how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond! Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie! Expecto Patronum! Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this episode, I sit down with Rory McGregor. Rory has been directing some wonderful projects here in the city, and we talk about all of them. We focus on the beginning of his directing career and the little moments and actions he took that changed the trajectory of his career up into this point. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did having the conversation with Rory. Enjoy. We're back. I'm Clayton Howe, and today with me is Rory McGregor. Rory, thank you for chatting with me today. Hey, I'm a pleasure. So we met through some mutual friends. We did, yeah. Chilling up in the Heights. Yeah. Which is always so much fun, because you never know who you're going to meet on someone's couch. Yeah, it's someone's living so room. weird. I've been up there for five years now, which is very, really weird. I can't believe I've been in this country for five years. That's mad, but yeah. So you've been at that in the same location up there, roughly? No, I've had the most... I'm just going to tell everyone where I live, but... Um, you uh, have to. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I've lived in the same sort of 10 blocks for five years, which is mad. I sort of started at okay. 151 moved down to 144 you know getting a little bit experimental a little bit crazy and Hello. Then up to uh 156 you know so i've literally yeah. just done uh the same yeah sort of 10-ish blocks yes. for the whole time i've been here i should probably branch out and go to brooklyn or something yeah the cooler. story yeah. is great yeah yeah oh no nah. maybe not for you <laughs> i don't know i haven't actually <laughs> i've never i haven't spent much time in queens but uh yeah it's there's some legendary diners out there uh okay on to the topics yes. of the day. Uh, are you willing, if you're willing, to share the story of how you ended up in the Heights? Uh, <laughs> oh, God, it makes it sound so much more interesting than it is. No. Um, so basically, yeah, I uh, I sort of had a weird upbringing. I was born in London, uh, and then my parents sort of worked in the tourism industry. So uh, I ended up moving to Portugal when I was 12, um and then sort of lived in portugal for six years and there's no i mean i, I obviously when you sort of go I, li I lived in an area called the algarve which is sort of like a i don't know if you've heard of it it's like a very touristy area lots of sort of british people live there or go on holiday there um there isn't a huge theater scene there um so i didn't i i, I was i didn't really see a, an awful lot of theater um in my school there wasn't i went to a very small school so there wasn't many particularly sort of talented actors so i ended up sort of taking a lot of the major roles um and thought i wanted to be an actor and then one day i was sort of in this um english uh literature class and i was studying um a clockwork orange um and looking at that book and another book called brighton rock and um my you know i i i my oh, that's um, fine. Can we? Because you can cut. You can cut stuff. Right? I can. You I don't, don't usually. Really, no. I actually keep all of it in, but I can cut you know, it for you, Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Do you know what? It's just weird. I suddenly got flustered. I don't ever get flustered, but um, I just the stakes are high. The, the stakes are so open. high. Yeah. Um. Uh. God, I've done. Okay. I just, orange. I think it's just my. Um. I don't know. Maybe I'm a little bit um disorientated with this um cold. But anyway. Um, I'm going to backtrack and just start again so it's easier for you. Yeah, so so here we go. So, yeah, how I sort of got into directing was sort of around the houses a little bit. I um, uh, grew up in Portugal, actually, because my parents worked in the tourism industry. I went to a school, the International School of the Algarve. It wasn't a big school. There was only sort of like 25, 30 kids in my class. Uh, it was English language. Um, and as a result, because it was so small, I ended up sort of playing a lot of the major parts, even though I'm not the world's greatest actor, you know, and I was playing sort of Macbeth, you know, really gracing the boards, getting okay, five stars. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was terrible. But, um, but I, so I was quite into acting, although there was a part of me that knew that I, I wasn't that sort of talented at it. And then, um, yeah, I was, uh, same teacher taught my English literature class. We were studying A Clockwork Orange, um, the book by Anthony Burgess. And um, she was a bit of a hippie. Um, I was 15. 
she was a bit of a hippie and she decided that it was okay for 15 year olds to watch the movie. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, but it's quite, you know, it's quite intense, uh, especially for a 15 year old. So she said, your homework is go home, watch the movie. So I went home and I watched it and I absolutely hated it. I thought it was terrible. And the reason I hated it was that I thought that this guy, whoever he was, I was very, I didn't know what I was talking about, but I was like, whoever this guy was, um, he completely missed the point of the book. And so the next day I went into school and my teacher said, you know, she went around the class and she was like, so what did you think of the movie? Blah, blah, blah. And she said, Rory, you usually talk a lot. What do you think? And I said this to her. I was like, well, this guy, this director, whoever he was, he, did, he completely missed the point of Anthony Burgess's book. Um, and my teacher said, that's interesting. Uh, I want you to go back and sort of watch it again and imagine this time that a director's job is to just interpret that like, this is just one person's point of view on this text. There's no, you know, a, a film isn't, doesn't have to just sort of completely um, faithfully reinterpret the the book. It can be one person's point of view. And I went back and watched the movie again and it changed my life, like sincerely. Like after that, I completely understood the sort of job of a director and I decided that that was what I wanted to do. And I was like 15 um, and I started making, making these really bad short films that uh, will never see the light of day uh i used to uh, edit um trailers on youtube as well like game i was very into games and i used to like halo i used to re-edit trailers and stuff um and it, then, was there was there editing features on halo no i mean um, on youtube sorry oh god look this is bad but i uh <laughs> i had um you know sony vegas no so it was this like editing software. I don't know if it's the same. I mean, I haven't edited anything in like 10 years, so I don't know if it's the same, but it's come a long way. Yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> but I had like a, I was quite naughty. I had like a cracked version of it. Okay. You know? Yeah. 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 And like, I, pi like a pirated thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I used to just sort of make the uh, videos on that. Cause it was like, I, yeah, I was like 15 and it was like 300 pounds or something for this editing software. So mm. yeah, I, uh, I used to edit um, my own little videos there. They were terrible. Um, and then, um, yeah, I uh, so then I moved back to the UK and there was a brief stint where I sort of wanted to be a politician. I worked in the Houses of Parliament, uh, it, you know, I, I don't know um, sort of how many people in America know this. This is, may come across as incredibly patronizing, but you know where Big Ben is like that's actually yeah. where our government is. Right. Okay. Um, and so I've, I, I, it was kind of mad at sort of 18 or so to be in that building you know for nine months i worked there and i sort of decided that politics wasn't for me sort of went to undergrad um how did you end up in that building yeah so um i so i really as i said i really wanted to be a director right and i left school you know finished school at 18 and uh, decided to take a gap year which we do a little bit in england of sort of a, you know between uh, school and university taking a year off and i went to i i just sort of applied to it was like 200 jobs or something. I just sent all of these emails off and I got about five interviews out oh. of like 200. Yeah. And one of them was, um, yeah, for this member of parliament, uh, this politician to be his intern. And I, and it was his chief of staff and we really hit it off. And I, it was only a three month contract and they liked me so much. I sort of ended up being there for nine months. Wow. Uh, and uh, they even sort of offered me a job when I graduated university. They were like, if you want to come back. And so there was a career in politics that I could have had. Yeah. Um, but I just, it wasn't for me, like that whole environment. I decided that f what w was more interesting for me was sort of, you know, examining society and, and culture and politics through the lens of art making rather than um, being in it in it itself if that makes sense yeah. so uh in that summer i actually came here to america um i did a program called camp america where british uh sort of kids um are end up being counselors at like camps around here and i was the head of drama at a kids camp in um ohio Carrollton, ohio they gave me the choice of la or Ohio, and I chose Ohio. You're looking at me very strangely. I chose Ohio because I was like, when will I ever go to Ohio? You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, I've never been back. It was good. No, it was nice. It was nice. I loved, loved Ohio. Oh, I'm sure Ohio's great. I've never been to Ohio. Lots of Amish where I was, actually, oh, yeah. which was fascinating because we didn't have anything like that. So I, was, I just, you know, I picture you just like chatting with your friends 
you know, over in England, and you're like, well, should I go to Ohio or LA? And they're like pulling one over on you, and like, no, Ohio's yeah. the new LA, and you don't like, know any yeah, better. So, you so go they got a real burgeoning sort of film scene. Yeah, in, and then in you end Ohio, up yeah, with no electricity and horses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just, you know, they, it's all DIY. It's indie, indie movies. So I, I ran it. <laughs> I ran the kids, the kids camp, the the drama program there, and then um, went to undergrads and uh sort of studied history because i uh, you know still wanted to have an academic background i mean i'm a big history nerd and then in the three years that i was uh in undergrad university of york um i directed like i don't know it was like in three years maybe 20 things I, um and it was all theater yeah. so i started to move from film to theater See, how did all these opportunities come up for you though so quickly like <laughs> uh, i've I, so my dad, my dad is very, uh, <laughs> my dad is a very uh, sort of self-made man. Uh, I, I was the, the the thing that I my parents really instilled in me from a young age is if you want to do something, you got to do it yourself. Like there's no, like no one's going to help you, right? Yeah. Um, and so I don't know why. Also, I'm an Aries. I'm not really into astrology, but I think that I am an Aries in that I'm very impulsive and very sort of driven and. And so I just, um, I, I just go for something. Like if I, if I really want something, I just sort of, I, 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 I'm very single minded. I just, I, I think for me, what's really helped me in my career so far is having a one single goal that I'm always working towards every day. So that means that, Mm. you know, in a day, if, even if I'm a bit lazy and I don't do anything, as long as I accomplish one thing in my day that is going towards that one goal then I feel as if I'm sort of on the right track, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. And, you know, there is this, I think it's a very sort of, it's in a lot of self-help books and things, I think, but this idea of, I think it really is true, this sort of idea of um, if you can visualize it, you can do it. Like, it, you can't, you're never going to achieve something if you can't see it ahead of you, right? Because mm-hmm. you're not going to, you're just going to be going through the weeds. Mm-hmm. And so even from a young age, I, I had the visualizations I had were massive and crazy. You know, I was like, when I was 18, I was like, okay, I want to be either a director, um, a politician, or I think also a comedian at one point. But, 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 but putting those big, visualizations in front of me meant that when I applied to hundreds of jobs they were very specific and even though I I only got interviews for five it meant that I could talk quite clearly and articulately about what why I wanted to work in politics or or whatever uh, for example yeah um and and what's just happened over time I think as I've got older is is what I want and sort of whittled down until it's just one thing you know I I'm uh, directing for me is just sort of I, I realized, um, you know, it always been there, but it wasn't until I went to undergrad and I started doing it a lot more frequently that I realized it was something that was just very easy and very, um, it felt very natural and I really sort of enjoyed doing. Yeah. Um, so, so I, 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 I didn't do anything else. I didn't do my degree really. <laughs> I just wow. sort of focused on directing the thing about england is very different to america is when you go to university in the uk you only do one subject for three years um and so and also your contact hours like i.e when you're in seminars or lectures are actually quite low so i ended up you know by the by my last year i was in classes for about four hours a week right that's it what? yeah four hours a week they treat you you have to be like they, they're trying to treat you like an academic you know you're yeah. reading books on your own and all that right um and so i just ended up just relentlessly directing just constantly it was all i was doing were you looking for these opportunities these opportunities were looking for you um i there was a drama society at my university which is quite is pretty bad uh in the sense like i shouldn't say that because i do love it but um (laughs) it's i mean it's just like a barn it was an old farm barn at this uh, university that had been converted into a theater space and run by students since the 1960s it was like a student society it wasn't um uh, run by the university or whatever and but it has like quite prestigious people have come out of it for example simon stevens uh, the playwright who did curious instant of the dog in the nighttime you know yeah. the um stage ad- adaptation um the ex-artistic director of a theater in london called the lyric hammersmith um anthony horowitz if you know that author 
Mm. Uh, he wrote um, it's a book series. I can't remember. It's very famous. But uh, so it's got quite a good reputation. And, and, and the reason for that, I think, is because because it's a, a student run space, you can do whatever you want to it. So it allowed real mm. creativity. And um, the first year I got there, it was quite a cliquey society. And I pitched to get in about, about three times, different shows. You would pitch and then they would choose shows to be put put on. And they, they didn't take any of my shows. And then finally, in the last semester of first year, they said yes. Uh, and then that was it. And then once I was kind of in, I just kept, I was like, I'm not letting go of this. And I just sort of kept pitching things and kept getting things on. And then I went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival as well. I took, I, I, I did the Edinburgh Fringe like three times, it took about three shows in total. Um, I did a festival called the National Student Drama Festival in Britain as well. Um, it was just, it just became like um, an obsession. I, I think, I don't know what it's like here, but in Europe or in Britain, and, or at least in British schools, no one ever tells you that directing, for example, is like a career, like it's something that you can do. Mm -hmm. Especially, like, you, you know, everyone knows about acting. Everyone knows about, you, you know, um, fil even film directing, but theatre direct directing, there was no real clear route into it and i don't i still don't think there is i think it's you kind of stumble into it a little bit you know you have to f sort of find your own way a bit um to get into it yeah no that's true i guess yeah i don't you know i don't know because it's also like in theater and i've said this in other episodes theater is trending yeah it seems right here i think would you would you mean by that I, well, I think from some of like the TV shows, like Smash and yeah. Billy and what have you, there's more um, actors or people pursuing acting than ever before. Right. But it's interesting because I had a similar uh, conversation with um, a couple casting directors, and they think the opposite. So I don't know. If it's like if it's what a folk you know you focus on you find, or if it's so they actually think that true. less people are actually going into it. Yeah. Now. That's that's kind of interesting. What do you think? Um, oh, I don't know. Someone said to me, I don't know what you think about this, but someone said to me that the people who sort of make it in the theater industry are the people who just sort of stay in it, yeah. like the longest. You know, like um, I think that a lot of people start out in acting or directing or whatever, but either they find their way into something else in a similar field or they, they move on to... Uh, uh, something entirely different you know like they go into banking or something yeah. um because i think i mean freelancing especially is diff it's really difficult but um yeah. you know um you know everyone says that is not true but i've heard people say uh, like that every other person in the theater industry be that like a playwright a director a stage manager or whatever are all just frustrated actors you know <laughs> Maybe a little bit true. Yeah. I Well, I feel like, you know, I don't know whether or not they're frustrated, but definitely the trend seems to be that like anyone else who does anything in the theater yeah. started out yeah. as an actor. I, d I mean, I believe that. I Agent, don't, but... Agents, casting directors. Yeah. I, I mean, for, for me personally, I, I just realized I couldn't do it. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 I was okay. Like it was fine when I was in school. And then actually when I got to undergrad, I, I started auditioning for stuff. And I ended up getting, you know, like, do you know Animal Farm, George yeah. Orwell, right? You know, um, good book. Yeah. Well, someone, it, I, I, someone had turned it into a play, and they were doing it, yeah. and I auditioned for it, and um, I, I, I got the role of the farmer. Um, now, do you remember the farmer from the book? Vague. No. Yeah. No, you won't, because he's killed like in the first two pages, <laughs> and that was kind of like a wake up call to me that actually this is not the thing that I'm supposed to be doing, you know, if not actually, not only was I the farmer, I was pig three and pig three was brought on at a certain point with a bucket on his head and was executed. And I had three lines. So, uh, you know, uh -huh. not, not like, a and that was it for you. <laughs> yeah. Not the next Leonardo DiCaprio or something, you know, it was, uh, oh yeah, that was the end. I, 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 I realized, you know what? I think that this is not the right path for me. Um, but I don't know, you know, like a uh, sort of. I I could go. I could go back to it at some point. It might be fun. 
Yeah. I mean, the opportunity is always there. There's always yeah. going to be some time, some place for you to do that. But okay, so then what was the? I hope I'm not skipping too much. No, no, no. What was the transition then from coming over the pond? You know, skipping over yeah. the pond. So, um, uh, so basically, I was at so I was at undergrad, and I yeah, I'd done all these different shows. And um, while I was at uh, undergrad, I'd read a couple of books uh, by a. A theater director and sort of theoretician called Anne Bogart, um, sort of legendary American theater director. And she'd written viewpoints, um, you know, sort of movement uh, uh, stuff and uh, a number of different books like Conversations with Anne. Uh, and I really liked her approach to theater. I liked the way that she talked about it. And I'd always had this suspicion that great artists have great mentors, right? Like you can kind of uh, look back at, an artist's trajectory and see how different people have sort of influenced and helped them on the way. Um, and I, sure. and I wanted to sort of work with a, a, a great director and it's a very rare program in at Columbia university where, you know, Anne Bogart runs the directing program, takes six students a year. Um, and it's just her, like you get to spend sort of three years with her and a guy called Brian Kulik, who used to run classic stage company. So how did you get in? Well, so here's the thing, right? I didn't, uh, <laughs> um, you know, like, how are you here now then? So I was really, I was like 21 when I auditioned, I was really young. I was still at, um, undergrad and I went and you do this mad, um, I'm realizing I'm saying mad a lot. Um, this uh, look what's the synonym crazy uh this crazy yeah, sure, crazy yeah. yeah i'm just trying to you know switch it up yes yeah, <laughs> switch yeah, it up. yeah sure i have a little bit of a larger vocabulary than it you appears. know it's funny i was listening to myself the other day on one of these and i was like wow i say etc 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 like that three times a lot like in all of your interviews yeah like every single one. That was the first time I said it for this one. Yeah. <laughs> there but. we go. Well, you've got, you've got to keep your brand. You know, maybe that's I should, your... I got to cut it down to one. Though, maybe. Just you one. don't say mad, mad, mad. Well, who knows? <laughs> maybe I'm going to do another podcast after this where I just... All I say is mad as my descriptor. <laughs> so anyway, um, I... Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so I came Lunatic. Over... There was crazy. <laughs> well, they do this... So Anne does this crazy thing where she invites 25 uh applicants like the, the she whittles it down to 25 applicants and invites them over here to new york to audition and it's a it's basically 48 hours of directing that's all you're doing and you're wow. doing it in front of her and other people and you have to act as well by the way yeah. and um i uh, basically what you have to do is you have to sort of present a piece and another director acts in it and uh, you know they have to be completely off book and um it has to be completely costumed and lit and everything and uh my one went okay and then i went to do the piece for the director that i was working with and um it was all going well i mean i get in the credible stage fright like i was really sort of nervous and i was doing um the piece uh, it was this like uh you know, um, I did a poem and I had to pick up this uh, rope and walk towards um, this uh, light bulb, which was in this box in the middle of the stage. And I'm sort of picking it up and I'm going and I'm remembering the lines and it's going well and people are, s are making noise in the audience. I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe I am an actor after all. And then suddenly uh, they're making noise and uh, the lights have flipped on and I realize that someone's screaming at me and pointing at the box and the director had put the... Um, the light bulb too close to the rope and the rope was on fire <laughs> yeah and so i had to run over and stamp this rope out and anyway we reset and i was so um sort of knocked out by that and um they weren't going to use the light bulb again for health and safety reasons so they put a load of um phones in the uh in the box uh, and turn the flashlights on and we turn the lights off and I couldn't see anything. And I'm just sort of wandering around the stage saying line, 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 trying to find this rope with this poor girl, like who, whose piece it was. Um, she was obviously like really sort of ups upset. And I, uh, and I went afterwards and sort of c comforted her. And anyway, I did, I didn't think I'd get in because I was like, there was, I, you know, we almost set the, the place on fire. Um, and I, and I didn't, uh, I, I got on the waiting list. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was that and I decided to take two shows to the Edinburgh Fringe that year and we were in rehearsals and this was um, in sort of July of 2014 and um, I hadn't checked my emails because I'd just been um, like just rehearsing so much I hadn't really been on my computer and I didn't have a smartphone and I went on my um, on my on my on my emails on my computer and i had like five emails from Anne being like someone's dropped out do you want to come blah blah blah. this was three weeks before the program was due to start by the way 
Um, and you're here or you're back I was in, in London. You're yeah. So I, I was rehearsing the show that was going to the Edinburgh Fringe. Right. And so I, I, I didn't know what to do, you know. So I rang my dad and I was like, you know, the fees are like $60,000. There's no way we can pay for this. Um, you know, I don't have anywhere to live. I don't really know anyone over there. Should I take this? And, you know, I was yeah now 22. And my dad gave me the best piece of advice. He was like, just go. And he was like, you'll figure it out when you, uh, when you get over there. Like, we'll buy you the plane ticket. Just go out there and try and make it work. And five years later, I'm still here, <laughs> like, which oh, wow. is kind of nuts, you know, and had to, over the course of that time, find different sources of income and, you know, sort of a scholarship up to my eyeballs and just sort of trying to get through the program. Um, but it was the best decision I made because it was three years to just really work on your voice as a, as an artist and i think it's an amazing also to 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 be in a class of just six directors including yourself it's amazing to sort of be that intimate with other people's work and other people's work that's so different from yours you know there was a, a woman in my class who is um from iceland and had a very sort of unique aesthetic to her work there was another amazing artist from argentina who is a film director who turned into a theater director you know, it, it was a guy from Norway, you know, it was it was just a, a collection of people from around the world and just seeing and I, I, I think that the, the most vital thing in art and, and, and where the best art is made is when it's in dialogue. It's like a culture in dialogue with another culture or a voice in dialogue with another voice um, because it's sort of only like that that you can really sort of learn something. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I graduated in 2017 and um, yeah, I've just sort of been working in the industry since then, you know. And now, okay, so this is really interesting to me because I don't yeah. know how it works for directors. You're studying yeah. at Columbia. Yeah. Are you contacting yeah. other people here in the city saying, hey, can I shadow you? Yeah. Be your assistant, um, get you coffee? <laughs> like, what was that? Pro what was that? Yeah, well, because that's what's weird, right? Because like... I actually, in some ways, and I don't, I don't mean this in a sort of woe is me kind of way, but I, in some ways, I do think that directors have it more difficult. Young directors have it more difficult than, say, young actors, because with that, with a, as as an actor, there's always, pardon me, um, there's always auditions, and there's always something you can always go somewhere and audition for something. Yeah. Whereas as a director, it's self generated, really yeah. everything. You have to be someone who isn't afraid of of reaching out to people and afraid of making your own opportunities. So what I did was, yeah, I blasted emails out to everyone while I was still at Columbia to, to like to who, how did you find those emails? Um, well, <laughs> or any that you can, any stories that yeah. you can share. <laughs> no. Um, and, and also, also, and the other thing you do is you have to just make your own work, you know? And I, and I was lucky enough to do a lot of that, when I was in undergrad, just sort of self-generating material and taking it to the Edinburgh Fringe. So I had a sort of backbone in that. Um, no, I think that, well, yeah, I mean, the big, it was kind of not mad. It was kind of crazy. Um, now I'm going to use crazy too much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, um, <laughs> you know, my first job out of um, Columbia was, I was the assistant director on um, M Butterfly on Broadway that, yeah, Julie Taymor directed. I was her assistant director. Um, and David Henry Wong, um, who's the playwright, he was a professor at Columbia. And um, and this is what I mean about sort of making your own opportunities. I um, was also a, a, a burgeoning playwright. Like I, I, I've directed a lot of the plays that I've written as well. Like I kind of write material for myself and then direct it. And, um, and that's what I did. I used to do a lot of the Edinburgh Fringe. And, you know, I reached out to David while I was at Columbia and said, hey, like, is there any way I could do like a kind of private study with you? And he was like, yeah, of course, you know. And it was only because I asked that he would, you know, that opportunity would have sort of never been open to me yeah. I, if I had known about that. And so we spent, you know, a semester together um, where he was mentoring me on some plays that I'd written. And then we were having sort of coffee one day and I asked him what he had coming up. And he said, you know, Julie was going to be directing M Butterfly. And I sort of gushed about I'd just seen Midsummer Night's Dream that she did at Theatre for a New Audience. And, you know, obviously The Lion King and... 
um her films uh, like across the universe i'd always been a, a big fan of her um vision and i sort of gushed to him and said i would learn so much from her like i can't believe blah blah and he was like yeah well why don't you write a letter to her and i'll send it to her so i did that and um she didn't respond <laughs> <laughs> for six months uh, and then i got like a one line letter back being like yeah i'll meet you uh, and then we ended up meeting um, and it was only supposed to be like a 20 minute meeting and we spent about two and a half hours together uh, and we realized we sort of had a lot artistically in common and I, I just sort of went into, you know, because it's really, as you can probably tell from this podcast as well, um, I the reason I'm not an actor and the reason I'm a director is I find the idea of any kind of self publicity or any kind of self um like like anywhere where I have to be on a stage or in front of people, I find it incredibly nerve wracking. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm sort of riddled with anxiety and it's sort of weirdly, I guess, sadomasochistic that I work in this industry because I'm surrounded by people who can do it so amazingly. <laughs> but, I, no, but I love that. Like, yeah. that's why I do it. I like, yeah. I, I have like a, a huge love and ad admiration for actors because it's like something that I can't do. Like I physically, and the further I get away from those days in high school where I was like playing Macbeth or whatever, yeah. the harder I find it. Like, because... I can't t turn off my director brain, you know, it's always like, I'm always analyzing everything. Um, but anyway, so like even going to ha have a meeting with someone like her or whatever is, is, is incredibly nerve wracking, of course. Of course. But, you know, I spoke to a friend of mine who was like, you know, you just go in there and you, and just treat it as if um, you want to learn from her. Right. And that ha has sort of been the best piece of advice that I've received on sort of interviewing and, is that the best thing to do is is um really quite honestly just communicate like what you really honestly want out of that situation right and 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 in in that circumstance rather than trying to big myself up or you know pander to what i thought she might be looking for i just went in there and was like i want to learn from you i love your work yeah um and i guess she responded to that because we ended up working together and um and that's the same thing as like Obviously, I'm nowhere near that point in my career yet, but, you know, I've had assistant directors and I've worked with people, you know, on, on my projects who are sort of starting out. Um, and that's the thing that I always look for as well. Is like, are you genuinely passionate about the same things that I am, you know? Um, and I think that that is, is like really important is for any sort of director starting out, I think what you have to do is you just have to really figure out who like figure out whose art you're interested in in you don't even have to know what kind of art you want to make yet but figure out whose art you're interested in and find a way to reach out to those people yeah. and just ask if you can do something like you know get the coffee or do the whatever or just be in the room because that you know you get to learn from those people and then those people sort of get to know you as well and and your your network just becomes sort of bigger and bigger or or your tribe, I guess, is a better word for it. Yeah, yeah. that's a 2019 word for it, right? Tribe. Tribe. Yeah. yeah build yeah, your yeah. tribe. Yeah, build your tribe, your theater tribe. So you're doing M. Butterfly. Yeah. And you're hitting it off with Julie. Yeah. So to speak. <laughs> what were the following projects that came up? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I've done a lot of... Since I've graduated, I've done a lot of weird stuff. I've done a lot of my own work. I did, so my thesis was Macbeth, uh, which I'm sort of currently trying to remount. I did, a, I directed at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts quite a bit. I did Richard III there. I did... Um, was that another connection through... Well, yeah, the guy Columbia who... Or was that your own? No, thing? no. So this is another thing is you just got to do the work and invite people to it, really, as a director. Yeah. You know, I invited a bunch of people to my thesis and one of them was the head of the American Academy of Dramatic Arts who came because there was a couple of his ex-students in the show. And uh, he reached out to me afterwards and was like, you seem to be good at Shakespeare. Do you want to do a Shakespeare at um, our school? And so I did that. Um, and then I did, um, yeah, a, a new Canadian play there. And then I, I put up my own work. I did, um, there's a very close collaborator of mine, me and him completely devised a, com a completely new play about um an art a jazz musician um and then um since then i i also worked at roundabout theater company um as a sort of an artistic apprentice in my last year at columbia um and yeah since then i i've worked on seawall a life um 
and also uh, currently working on Inc., uh, which is at MTC um, on Broadway. Uh, and, it, you know, so that you, I've kind of begun to split my career um, into three sectors, which is my own work, um, my work for other people, i.e. assistant or associate directing, and then also um, teaching. Like I teach it, I direct, um, sorry, I um, mentor directing students at NYU as well. Um, you know, and you find that each sector nourishes the other sector and that you can't, like if you, you get burnt out, if you're just directing too much, you get burnt out. If you're just ADing, you get burnt out. If you're just teaching, you get, you know, you have to kind of have a balance of all of them and they all kind of help each one, I think a little yeah. bit. Yeah. What have you learned from working with these like top performers or heavy hitters. Yeah. Are there lessons that you've taken away about their work ethic or your work ethic? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think, um, <laughs> one, one or two. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, I think a big thing is communication. And I, and I think that, um, this is going to be the most pretentious thing I say today, maybe, um, you know, I, I, I this job, like being in the theater, I think is all about, human connection like what it boils down to at the end of the day is like human connection and truth yeah and you know the the more i work with yeah like sort of big people in the industry that the 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 the, the more i realize it's just about forging real like vulnerable relationships with people, people want to just feel sort of safe uh and in a context where they can do the work that they want to do if that makes sense like it does like it's not about like the prestige and the status and everything it's not about anything like that it's about just doing the work and you know it's i think it was brian cranston i think right who said he was talking about someone was asking him about like how he got his break in the industry and what um advice he would have to young actors about auditioning and he said, um, just go in and sort of tell your story, you know, just go, go in there and audition and just treat it as if like, okay, I have a captive audience here. I'm going to have to tell, I'm just going to tell my story to them mm. because that somehow makes it more truthful. Cause like when you're auditioning or something, if you're thinking, if your eye is always on the prize or the thing that's ahead of you, then you're never going to be sort of truthful in the moment. And I realize that I'm sort of contradicting what I'm saying earlier about like always having an idea of where you want to be. But I do think that those two things are separate. It's like you in the moment being truthful and honest with what you, who you are and what you want and, and what the, um, what the parameters of that are. And then the, the wider thing, which is outside of that of like, you know, just for you, like this is where I'm sort of aiming in the future mm -hmm. because I think that people can usually smell, uh, when someone is just trying to like game them or something, right? Like when they're not being truthful or honest. Oh yeah, yeah. Use them for personal. Yeah, games yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah, can yeah. smell that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, genuine. When someone's not being genuine, you can yeah. definitely. You can definitely tell. Yeah, I think so. What have you learned about? So I want to kind of riff on this: the human communication yeah. and being truthful. And honest and seeing mm -hmm. someone, you know, like I see you yeah. in a way. What have you learned about human communication then from communicating with actors in rehearsal process? Like, like, is this more on an existential level about like, what do I think about sort of the way humans interact with each other? Or, or do you mean like literally on a practical level of like, um, how have I changed as as a director? Like, how? yeah, let's start practical. Yeah, and then we can go to big, no, the because then we can go to existential. Yeah. Um, I think you know, I, uh, I think that this honesty. I'm going to go further with this honesty thing. Like, I, I think that I don't know. Like, when you start directing, when you, when you, you, you're kind of just throwing a lot of, um, you know, crap at the wall and hoping that some of it sticks you don't really know what you're doing or so the way that you talk to people often is you, you're not like you don't know how to elicit the best um like how do i best help an actor get to the place that they need to get to i guess the number one thing that i've learned as i've got further into it is that 
you know, a character, in my opinion, and I, you know, could be completely wrong, but this is what I do and I think about as a director, is that a character is just an agreement between um, a director and an actor. Like, the actor thinks that a character is one thing, the director thinks a character is another thing, maybe, and then the actual character, the one that you see on stage, is the agreement that the director and the actor have sort of forged together, right? Yeah. Like, I think that the idea that the director is sort of that their voice is like paramount uh is is definitely wrong like i think that best directors are sort of collaborative like i see myself as sort of like a world builder like i build the world and then give the actors enough uh leeway to sort of play within it and create their own you know worlds within the world that w we've sort of created um outside of that yeah and I think as I've sort of progressed through the industry, yeah, I've realized that the best um, directors have that sort of ethos, like this idea that it's, you know, that the room that when you go into the rehearsal room, there's like a joy and, and a real excavation of like of the play and of the character that's taking place together, like that the director and the actor and everyone in the room are sort of working together, you know? Yeah. I mean, and going back to sort of Julie, you know, I when I worked with her, she's obviously her work is so um like specific and you know it has a very yeah specific aesthetic and a very specific kind of um lens the, the way everything is is um is being um presented but she was incredibly collaborative with actors like i you know she wasn't being like stand here and say this thing in this exact way it's like mm -hmm. what do you think about this mm -hmm. because that's the way that it's you're going to it's going to seem more truthful for the audience, right? As if the actor fe like no completely understands every single moment in the play. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause then it doesn't look put on. Yeah. Yeah. Or like you're doing something someone else told you to do. You're doing what you, and I think, yeah. And I think that as you, uh, I don't know, I think as you sort of go on and you direct more as well, you realize what you're when what you're saying is faff and you can sort of cut it down and be more lean and and know when to listen and not to talk and you know sometimes actors just need to figure out things on their own as well and there's a strength in in sometimes just being silent and allowing that to happen you yeah. know yeah have you found yourself speaking less and listening more or listening less and speaking more from from the days in. in the barn to yeah the days in the barn uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> i know it might not seem like this on this podcast but definitely speaking less and listening more i think that there's like a weird um insecurity when you start out where you have to explain everything like every idea mm. and there are just things that aren't useful for actors like you don't need to like i as i said earlier i'm a massive history nerd and so when i'm directing a play if there's any historical context in it or if there's any kind of parallel or something, I do all this massive background reading. It's just because it nourishes me and it, and it makes for me the, the design and everything more full, right? But it doesn't, that stuff doesn't need, the actor doesn't need to know that stuff, you know, mm. unless they want to because it's like that can, you can really get in someone's way, you know? It's, it's like the, the classic example is like, you, you know, an actor doing something like really hilarious in a in a show and then the, that night the director being like oh my god that was so funny and this is why it was funny and then they go on stage the next day and it's not funny and it's because <laughs> they've just over explained the the joke and the construction of the joke like rather than just letting the actor you know sort of find it themselves um because because at the end of the day it's not me who's on stage right so true yeah, yeah. are there common pieces of incorrect advice that you've heard in your field common pieces of incorrect advice oh yeah probably i'm trying to think but that's the thing is this is the thing about like the other thing right that i really believe is that this is just my this is what works for me and then for another director something else entirely will work I you could have a completely different conversation yeah like different. i've yeah. worked with directors where so so for like let me give you an example right like so when i direct a play i go into the process knowing exactly like what the world is 
I don't know what happens in every scene. Like, I don't know the exact blocking of every scene. I'm not one of those directors who writes down, like, you know... Um, on this line, yeah. cross stage left. Yeah. yeah, well, that I do think is death. Like, I do think that that is... Like, the idea that... Yes, okay, I do have one... <laughs> and then I'll go back to what I'm saying. I do have one thing that I think is a correct... Uh, incorrect piece of advice. The idea that actors are in any way sort of marionettes or just like <laughs> meat puppets or that something. That makes sense. But you do see, you you know, I yeah. know some people who, who think like, well, they are just sort of conduits for the lines to be spe- spoken out of. Do you know, like, I think that a, a great mentor of mine said something I thought was brilliant, which I love, which is that um, film is all about light and theater is all about actors like that theater really at its core is the actor's art form Mm. Um, because it's just them up there, you know, and they have to like, like in film, you could, you could, if you had a bad actor at the core of your movie, you could actually hide it. Like, I think, I think you could, or you you could could, edit it. You could present them in a way where it seems like a choice. Right. Whereas in theater, like if you, if you're doing Hamlet and the person playing Hamlet is like awful, you're, you're, you're in trouble. You know what I mean? Like, because you have to sustain that attention anyway of course so that's you know that's that but um but what i was saying is that every director is so different i like the story i thought was really interesting is that so i yeah like for me i i know what the world is before i go in and then i allow the i want the actors to kind of collaborate and sort of come up with their own uh ideas within that framework so an example would be like i did a yeah production of macbeth where i knew that it was sort of a contemporary um an exaggerated contemporary reality and we were looking at like the excesses of celebrity and it was about this guy who like in in our world macbeth became this massive sort of celebrity uh when he uh comes home at the beginning of the play from killing mcdonald's and then with Duncan, he he sort of goes into this world of excess, like there was all these orgies and drugs and stuff. And you know, at the at the core, like I knew I knew how, like that was the the arc of the uh, of the play for us that we were examining, sort of, you know, the the excesses of celebrity culture. I knew how how it ended. I had some sort of movement sequences, some music and things like that that I had in mind. But within that like the actors were allowed to sort of present their own. I mean, allowed isn't even the right word. The actors were encouraged to present their own ideas and their own, you know, and and collaborate and come up with stuff. And then I did a show with a director uh, who is, is, is is amazing, but I was terrified because it seemed as if like, so there was no, overarching vision to begin to begin with and we stuffed the play full of so much like so much um and every idea was encouraged Uh, but there were because there was no framework it was never moving towards anything there was just loads of ideas being like yeah let's do that and do that and do that so that by the time we got to previews the the world was 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 full of every possible um idea that this play could hold yeah. And I was like, this is too, this is too much. Like I was really scared. I was like, this thing's going to fail. It's like so bloated and whatever. And I realized then she then started to, in previews, just cut everything away until eventually it was just, it was just one thing. It was just, it became so simple and it became so, and I, and I completely realized that it was a director who had such a different voice and a different vision to my own. And it was so genius in, in her own way that, she wanted to explore every avenue and then come to the one that that she wanted to explore rather than what i do which is start at my avenue yeah. and and ki- and then the ideas are, are, are come in that one way it's just an entirely different way of using your brain you know that the idea of doing that is terrifying to me like the idea of just everything being a possibility is too much like um again it's the aries thing right it's like i can only see one thing (laughs) (laughs) no that's true yeah that would yeah that would i mean i can only imagine what people thought at the first preview yeah well it was amazing it was uh the first preview was great and it was because it like as soon as we finished it you know she was like this this is going this is going this is going like it was it, it, it i was like wow this person is uh yeah like a like a genius like yeah. a genius director because um it was you know it it was it, it was just really mind-blowing because it was such a different way of 
of directing to me and so that and that's sort of the point that I, I wanted to make is that I I don't feel like there is one way to direct it's about finding out what your what what works for your impulses you know yeah. like like if I tried to direct like that it would be a disaster because I couldn't I wouldn't I don't know it it would be I wouldn't know what to cut if that makes sense I need to have the idea like I um I need to have the idea first you know like you have some directors who are uh visual directors you know that they have um an idea of what the world looks like before they direct it there are some who are you know text based and and it's all about really deep excavation with the actors I always thought I was a visual director and then I realized sort of into my second year at Columbia that I'm actually an oral director, that I um, I get inspiration, I get images, and I get the play through music. And that's where I start. With every play that I direct, I start with a piece of music that, for me, encapsulates what the world feels like, if that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it's very, I don't know, yeah. It, um, it works for me. Yeah. Yeah. This conversation has been fascinating. Now I'm repeating words. No. <laughs> hey. No, it has. It's really interesting to hear the other side of, not the other side, but another piece of creating art. Well, yeah. I mean, what, like, I'm curious from your, but from your point of view, like, do you, you know, like, is, as an actor, what is it that draws you to, um, to theater? You know, like. I love telling stories. Really? That's why I do this. Yeah your story like your personal story i think there's so much to learn from someone else's story well because yeah yeah. i mean an art is made to educate i mean that's it's education in a way it can be entertaining but you can still learn something like kinky boots closed yesterday musical comedy very sad yeah very big themes in there for someone to learn yeah and it was actually written and directed in a wonderful way that could even keep someone who's may not who may not be fully open-minded yeah to those themes Mm -hmm. they could still learn something Mm -hmm. really brilliant to me so i'm all about storytelling yeah i guess i'm just quickly very curious about like when you work on a piece like as an actor and when you get cast in something like for example you did cabaret right yeah um do you are you is it exciting for you that you're getting to like be a part of a larger world or like like i'm just curious about you know because like for me the reason i couldn't be an actor is that and i I, I, and why i was so bad at it is what while i was acting i was always telling everyone else what they should be doing or like you know (laughs) because i was thinking of like the bigger picture you you can't stay in your own lane yeah yeah, i have the same i have the same thing though there's projects i've worked on where i've been in the back of the ensemble right and felt like i'm actually teaching the world something because the overall arc direction of the piece uh, was so educational. and Everyone was so critical. Every person in the show was so critical in telling that story Yeah, that I felt like I've had, I had worth, mm. you know what I mean? And then I've done projects where it's been none of that. Yeah. And I'm in the ensemble and it's like, Oh my God, mm-hmm. what am I doing? Yeah. You know? So it's, well, I think it's a mixed bag depends on the project, but, but definitely, I mean, for the very most part, I do feel as though I'm, contributing well like, yeah i guess the good thing about being an actor is you could take a project that you don't really care about but if <laughs> you know if it pays well like you know like because there is get know, some money well no. yeah i mean like you know you, you do a commercial for dog food you're not like gonna be like you know this commercial i think is really gonna change the way we perceive dog food i mean unless unless it does you know unless it's like a kind of you know, genre changing dog food, or something. <laughs> like well, world for the most part changing. Yeah, like um, whereas nice. as a director, you can't. I mean, I guess you can do that a little bit if you're in film or whatever. You can direct commercials and 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 stuff, but it's hard being uh, being the originator of a project. You always have to. Ca- I think you always have to. There's a deep level of care that you have to have, or for me at least, to draw me to a to a show. This isn't. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think it's interesting because I, you know, I'm at the beginning of an acting career yeah. and I consider it to be very fulfilling yet at the same time, 
I've been in productions where everything is great and then we get to the space and like the sound systems crap right, yeah. or something. And that to me is rather irritating. Yeah. Although I won't articulate or say anything about it yeah. personally, it's irritating. So I think there's a balance of finding, you know, cause I definitely want to perform, mm-hmm. but also where in there can I hold more power to make sure that everything is perfect. That sounds like Lee a, telling the story. That sounds like a producer. If you talk, if you <laughs> kind of what it sounds like. But it's that you know because yeah. I like, uh, yeah, I'd say I'm a perfectionist. But, but you know, like, um, so yeah, the the guy sort of c- came out of the drama barn. Simon Stevens, as I was talking about earlier, he said something that sort of really stayed with me a long time ago, which was. Um, uh, like that creativity comes from limitation that like whenever he writes a play for a long time he was actually thinking about the drama barn when he was writing because because it was so limited mm. and i think that like you know um as, as when when i see those limitations as a director for me they're exciting like that they're actually i think that sometimes the further up the chain you get the harder it becomes because the limitations become less and less and you can kind of do more and you know like if there was a bad sound system and it wasn't going to work you know there's a world where i'd be like okay we'll we'll scrap all the recorded sound and we'll just create it all on stage you know and then you find something new out of that like that is for me that's like really really exciting right really creative um, whereas yeah whereas you find that until the end of the process <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whereas being an, whereas be, when i was an actor it was like that stuff would be and it's the frustrated actor thing for me, I would be like, oh, no, like, um, you know, like I want to like I know how we can fix this thing, but it's not my place to to say it. You know, it's like um, which is difficult. But some people love, you know, because, you know, one of my best friends who's who's an actor loves um, why he loves acting and will never do anything else. And he's tried directing and, and, and didn't really enjoy it is the ability to sort of tell his own story within a larger framework is like really exciting to him. Like the, you know, the idea of like being able to really work very closely on crafting one character and, and like the minutia of that rather than the, the whole picture is like, is, is really uh, exciting for him. Whereas, whereas for me, like I can't, I don't know, I can't narrow down like that. I'm always thinking big picture. Yeah. 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 I think we'll all find a balance in there somewhere with with any of that. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting it's just interesting to navigate life and your path and what you're yeah. interested in. Yeah. And where your interests will take you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. Uh okay, so as we're wrapping up here, uh-huh. is there uh metaphorically a yes. word or a phrase that you would put on a billboard for millions of people to see? And it can be now it should be a quote from a play. This can be like a self-help quote. This uh-huh. can be a word. This can be a short story. As long or as short as you want it. Something yeah. that speaks to you that would speak to others. Does anything come to mind? Yes, I, I, I know what you're saying. Um, um, there is something recently. I think it changes a lot. But really, recently, the, the, the phrase that I like, and it's not mine at all, um, I think it's like a pretty common phrase. You've probably heard it before, is... Um, um oh wait hang on i want to get it right it's um the words you speak are the house you live in like that i've just i i really believe that like i think that Mm. the way you choose to define yourself is the way that you will define yourself because internally it's the way you will look at the world and externally it's the way the world will look at you if that makes sense that makes total sense yeah um and i don't know and i think that you know, uh, the power of positive thinking and all that stuff is, is there is a truth to that. Like the idea of if you have a bright, sunny, optimistic outlook, or you can kind of verbalize the things that you want in life or, you know, and, and then you go for them in a positive way, you're going to stand a much better chance than if you're, you know, saying that that it's never going to happen. Well then, yeah, it probably is not. It's true. (laughs) (laughs) Like I happen to be a big, in big agreement with that yeah yeah what you focus on you find yeah i mean focus on the good you find it focus on the bad you'll find it exactly and also you i mean like the thing is is that we craft our own realities right like we like 
like the way we view like and this is i mean i'm just repeating the quote but the way we view the world is what the world becomes for us like because you know we forget that like we're all just different like we all have such different outlooks and views and things and and the only thing that we can really control is the is yeah the way that we are um are, are dealing with the world and um i don't know i just i that has become for me a big because it is difficult like on 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 the surface like you know i came out of sort of grad school and and immediately booked a, a very good gig and i've been lucky enough to work like the first sort of year out of grad school i i i made a living entirely just from directing and ad work which is amazing yeah but there have but there have also been times where i haven't worked for like for months on end or it looked like i wasn't going to work at all you know and and it's about having the um the positive outlook and having the sort of ability to to go on and also i think that what's important as well in this industry is uh kindness i think that you know um there's another really great phrase that i like which is um there is no amount of talent that's a substitute for just being a nice person to have around and i think that's our job in this really tiny industry to sort of help each other out you know um and be kind and, and look after each other and prop each other up rather than punching Pushing each other down here. Yeah. Pushing rather than punching. Punching was a more, I guess, violent, yeah, image. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness. This conversation, Rory, thank you for chatting with me. No, this thank you. This has been so, fun. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Educational. Yes, it's been. I love uh, learning. Yeah, me, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Where can we find you on the social web? Um, you can go to my, I guess the best thing I like, I'm trying with Instagram and Facebook and things, but they're not, it's not good. I, I would go to my website, which is yeah. I'm very old school like that. Um, I'd go www.rorydmcgregor.com. Uh, That's the best place to find me, I suppose. Well, this conversation has been wide ranging, fascinating, educating. I appreciate you sharing your story. This I is I think other people are going to really enjoy it. Hey, thanks for having me. And I, I, I want to think before I speak here. I have not had a theatrical director on. Well, I have, but not in the path that you've had. Oh, I was going to say then. If you it's know, just I've had me. like people who have had like really significant acting careers right, and, and then transitioned into directing, but I haven't had, I haven't had someone who's, I don't think, yeah, who's yeah, I'm just studied. from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. You've really studied it and this is what you, you know, what you're doing. Is, I mean, that's what's mad is, uh, there you go. Uh, mad again. Uh, what's there mad is. is that th like, I've been doing this now. I'm like, yeah, I've been doing it for 10 years, which is nuts because, um, I don't know. Like it, I still feel like, you know, you still feel like you're sort of beginning. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, it's been, hey, if it's only been me, who's the only theatre director you've had on, the bar is pretty low. <laughs> I like oh, that. I, I like setting the bar. <laughs> so then when you get the next ones on, like they, there's going to be a, uh, yeah. you know, it, you can only go up from here. With oh, the, with <laughs> oh, you're no, too kidding. funny. That's well, the, thanks, man. The this e is English self-deprecation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Is there anything else you want to add right before we wrap up here? No, I think, I don't know. I think I rambled my way through my life. Uh, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I'd say if there are any theatre directors listening who are starting out and it confuses what to do, I think, yeah, like really, really just going to see plays is really important. Reading plays and figuring out like what it is, like what it is you want to do and who it is you want to work with and, and like the kind of, because you know, it's hard, like, it's hard, like, you can't, I don't think you can just blanket attack directing in a way, like, uh, that you can with other professions in that you have to be specific, I think, about, like, the kind of work you like and the kind of work eventually that once you've figured that out that you want to make, right? Like, I, as I said, Stanley Kubrick was the reason I got into directing in the first place, and out of that, I got into theatre directing because, um, as I was transitioning to go to um, undergrad, a friend of mine was like, hey, if you like Kubrick, you should read these plays. And he re he sent me these um, uh, in-your-face theatre plays from Britain, you know, like writers like Sarah Kane, uh, Philip Ridley, Mark Ravenhill. And um, I read them and I realized that people were doing 
on stage the kind of things that i'd really enjoyed in in movies mm. uh, and i and that kind of is what set me off you know and mm. um yeah and and just keeping at it because it's yeah it's it's it can be difficult you know it yeah be. yeah well very good man thank you right. thank hey. you for sitting down with me here no thanks for having me ladies and gentlemen boys and girls rory mcgregor <laughs> You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. <laughs>